to make just a few announcements while we're letting everybody else uh, join. Um, but uh, I wanted to just introduce our staff that are here this evening. My name is Amy Onder, and I'm the president and CEO of the Lucas Foundation of America Heartland Chapter. And also with us um, is Becca Rich. Becca is our COO. She also does a lot of work um, with our events and programs. And in case you haven't met Katie, this is Katie Castillo. Katie is our um, program manager and also our patient navigator. So if you are on the call tonight and you are uh, would love to get some help or some resources or looking for information, Katie would be your go-to person um, at our chapter office. Um, and I'll be introducing our speaker in just a minute, but in case you're not familiar with the Lupus Foundation of America Heartland Chapter, we are based in St. Louis, um, but we cover the state of Missouri, the state of Kansas, and Southern and Central Illinois. Um, before we get started, I want to remind you, just in case you um, are not familiar with what the work we do, uh, the Heartland Chapter currently offers online and in-person support groups. We recently just uh, launched two support groups, um, one in St. Louis and one in Kansas City. They meet monthly and are facilitated by volunteers who also have lupus. Um, we would love for you to join us um, if, you're, if you're in St. Louis or Kansas City area, um, or if you're not available um, or not in those areas, would like to join us online. We also have a online um, meeting group that meets on Zoom once a month. Um, you can find information about all of that, the location um, on our website. And Becca or Katie can go ahead and type in the chat what our website is, but I will let you know that it is lupus.org slash heartland. So if you're looking for any information, you can find it there. Um, and also, um, Tonight's uh, being recorded and we, after a couple of days, we'll get it edited and we will upload it to our YouTube channel. So um, you can find uh, this video, and many, many other videos on our YouTube channel. And again, you can find that information on our website. So lupus.org slash heartland. And I want to just remind all of you that the information provided in this webinar is for general informational purposes and it does not necessarily reflect the views of the Lupus Foundation of America. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the question section and our presenter will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of her presentation. And remember that lupus is different for everyone. And so our presenter may not be able to answer specific questions about your lupus. So please try to keep them um, general if you can. Okay, so it's about time we can get started. Um, I'd like to um, welcome our presenter for this evening, Dr. Sophia Chaudhry. Dr. Chaudhry is an assistant professor of dermatology at St. Louis University School of Medicine. She practices general dermatology with a specific focus in rheumatologic dermatology. She co-leads a combined rheumatology dermatology clinic with a rheumatology colleague. Dr. Chaudhry also has a sp special interest in skin color, skin cancer prevention, education, and diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chaudhry, and we will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Amy. Appreciate that. And thank you for the invitation to, um, to talk with all of you this evening um, and appreciate the Lupus Foundation's um, invitation, all the work that you do for our patients. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking about lupus and the skin and the hair, and um, definitely I will make sure to leave time at the end to answer questions. So um, hopefully um, you can kind of let me know the things that you'd like to know more about. And, um, but if, as I'm going along, if there's something you'd like to ask, you know, feel free. Okay. I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. If not, let me know. Okay. So this first picture here is a patient who had lupus, cutaneous lupus plus systemic lupus. And I just wanted to start off the presentation with uh, this clinical picture of a patient. And you can see how even this patient who doesn't have that active red malar rash 
even when the rash was somewhat improved, this is the sequelae, the after effect the, that was left behind from the prior rash. So lupus can have a lot of different manifestations on the skin, and we're going to go over them this evening to learn more about it. So here's a brief outline of what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about that we're going to concentrate on the different subtypes of cutaneous lupus, meaning skin lupus. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we go about evaluating the skin of a patient with lupus. We'll talk about how we um, do skin biopsies um, for diagnostic purposes. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we can do to help prevent flares of lupus in the skin. And then we're going to talk about some of the treatment options. So with lupus, as you all are familiar with, you know, this is a very complex disease that affects, can affect multiple organs. And so sometimes patients with lupus just have skin lupus and they have no internal findings. Other times patients have internal lupus, we call that systemic lupus erythematosus, but they never have skin findings. And then other times they have both. Um, but tonight we're going to learn about the skin findings. So first First of all, I wanted to explain that the skin categories of lupus are broken down into what are known as the Gilliam's classification. And these are sort of the three big categories of cutaneous lupus, of skin lupus. So the first one we call acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus. The next one we call subacute cutaneous lupus. And the last one is chronic cutaneous lupus. And these terms, acute, subacute, and chronic, are actually very helpful because they relate to both the pace and the severity of any underlying associated internal lupus or systemic lupus. And they also relate and help describe the, the chronic or the acute nature of the skin lesions. So they describe the length of time that those individual skin lesions are present on the patient. So they're um, a helpful classification to understand. So this is a little diagram to help illustrate how skin lupus and systemic lupus can overlap. So this gray circle, the large gray circle here, um, represents patients with SLE or internal, meaning systemic lupus erythematosus. So patients with joint disease, kidney issues, heart issues, um, blood, blood work abnormalities, all of that is part of internal lupus. And then these dotted lines represent the different forms of skin lupus and they help give you a, an idea of how the skin forms overlap. So this one that overlaps the most, we call that acute cutaneous lupus. Those patients who have this form of skin lupus are highly likely to have underlying systemic disease. And so those patients need a very complete workup and very close monitoring um, to look for signs of internal disease that may need to be treated more aggressively. This sort of middle category here, SCLE or subacute cutaneous lupus, which we'll talk about tonight as well, it's about sort of 50-50. So about half of patients will have internal involvement of their lupus and about another half will just have skin disease. And then this last big category here, the dotted circle that says CCLE, that stands for chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus, those patients with uh, are very low likelihood, relatively speaking, compared to the other types in having systemic disease, but they can, and so we'll talk about that. Okay, I also kind of wanted to mention a little bit about, before we delve in deeper into the skin subtypes, I wanted to mention a little bit about some of the blood work that's involved as screening test, because these are things that you will most likely encounter with your physician um, when they're trying to work you up. So like when we see a patient who has skin findings of lupus, we are always we always then go to that next step to look for signs of internal lupus. And one of the first steps, the first test that we do is a blood ANA test. And so this ANA, this anti-nuclear antibody is a blood test that's looking for this autoantibody that when it's positive can be concerning that there may be underlying 
systemic lupus, but it doesn't always mean that there is for sure internal lupus. It just need, means that we need to do more investigation and there is a higher risk. But if the ANA test comes back negative, then that's a very reassuring test. So we, I have on the slide here how a negative ANA has a negative predictive value of 99%. So if your ANA comes back negative, even if you have skin lupus, it's very unlikely that you would have internal lupus. But there are other autoantibodies that we check, um, but for the purposes of this talk, we won't be going into to really other ones um, where I just wanted to sort of mention this, this big one. And another thing that you may come across with your doctors when you have an ANA checked, they will sometimes report it to you with, a dif with different patterns. And the patterns can be helpful because they can suggest um, um, you know, a lupus clinical picture versus some other autoimmune conditions. So a positive ANA can be seen in lupus, but it can also be seen in other autoimmune conditions such as dermatomyositis or scleroderma. It's not always specific to lupus. Um, and so sometimes you may hear about these patterns. And there's different techniques that the lab will do to check for an ANA. Um, and um, you, you, these are things terms that you may hear about more with, with your doctor, but we won't go too, too far into that. And then lastly, another antibody I wanted to mention is a double-stranded DNA antibody, because this is one of the antibodies that actually does correlate with internal disease activity, unlike the ANA, which doesn't correlate with activity. So that's a common one that we check. Okay. So that was just sort of like, just a very, um, uh, a, a, a small sample of the labs that we check. So now I want to dive into the first main subtype of skin lupus, which is the acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus. So the most common presentation of this, which many of you may have heard of, is the butterfly rash, also called the malar rash. This is the most common presentation. So we'll take a look at pictures in a moment, but it presents as this confluent symmetrical erythema and edema over the malar cheeks, and oftentimes it extends over the bridge of the nose. But the key is that it should spare what are called the nasolabial folds. The nasolabial folds are the creases that go between the cheeks and the upper lip. So these are called the nasolabial folds. And in lupus, this area of skin is spared. Um, and this is actually very helpful. Because as I mentioned, there's another autoimmune condition that can have a positive ANA called dermatomyositis. And dermatomyositis patients can also have a rash that looks like a malar rash. But the difference is it that rash involves the nasolabial folds, whereas lupus patients, this area should be spared. It should be clear. And so that can be a big clue. The erythema can also extend over the forehead. It can involve the V of the neck, which is sort of the upper aspect of the neck. Sometimes the edema can be quite severe. The, the swelling can be significant. And although usually it's confluent, there are some rare cases where the erythema presents as in, um, individual or discrete macules or, or raised little bumps, which we call papules. And sometimes it can even become scaly. So the, they can sometimes present atypically. Now, the less common but more generalized form of acute lupus is where you get this widespread eruption of uh, kind of a morbilliform or xanthomous eruption. So that means you get these red macules and papules that are diffuse over the skin and not just the face. So here is a classic picture of a malar rash. And what's um, also helpful is you see nicely that that nasolabial fold, that area of skin is clear, it's spared. But the malar rash here, it does extend over the nose, but it's definitely prominent on the cheeks. Here's another picture of a patient who also has the um, this relative sparing of the nasolabial folds, and there is some scaling involved as well. Here's a picture of a patient who had the more discrete um, presentation where these individual papules. And when we see patients like this, you know, there's a broad differential in addition to lupus. So for example, there's a type of rosacea called granulomatous rosacea, which can look very similar. And rosacea is a very common skin condition. It's more common than lupus. And so it's really important that when we evaluate a patient with a rash like this, that, you know, that the doc that we or the doctor that you see is considering all the possibilities.
When lupus presents more generalized and it's not just on the face, but it's on the hands, it typically involves the skin between the joints and it typically spares the skin immediately on top of the joints. Whereas dermatomyositis, that other condition, which sometimes, like I said, can mimic lupus, that one should involve the joints. So it's a little bit of a different pattern. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, this, this form of skin lupus typically occurs in the context of underlying systemic disease. And so that's why these patients need to be, to, need to have a very thorough evaluation um, for systemic symptoms and for um, systemic organ involvement. These patients are very photosensitive. Um, their rash, as the name suggests, that acute word, it's, it indicates that the rash is often very transient. It lasts sometimes only several days to weeks. And so by the time a patient comes into the office, sometimes the rash is actually gone and you can't see it. But other times you can see the sequelae. You can, you can see what happens after the rash. So that very first picture I showed when we started the talk today was a patient who had the after effects. So she had what's called post-inflammatory pigment alteration. Um, her, her pigment alteration was actually a darker pigment than her normal skin tone. So we call that post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And we do tend to see more pigment changes in our patients with skin of color. They're more likely to have that after effect. But one thing that's um, different from this in this form of lupus compared to others is that there's no scarring when it resolves. So here's that picture again. It shows the pigmentation, some scale, but technically no scarring. There's another form of acute lupus, um, and it's sort of a syndrome called Raoul syndrome. And these, this type of lupus can present with lesions that look like another skin condition called erythema multiforme, which are these targetoid-like papules, which we'll take a look at in, the, in a moment. Um, and sometimes it can be, um, acute lupus can be so severe that it can mimic some, something we call toxic epidermal necrolysis, which is where the skin literally kind of sloughs off the skin. And so um, acute lupus, unfortunately, can have very severe presentations, but that's less common. Another form of skin lupus or acute skin lupus is when patients get ulcerations um, in their mouth or in their nose. The most common location is the hard palate. So that's what's shown in the picture, but you can see this, pa this patient also has some ulcerations in their um, nasal cavity as well. Here's some more pictures of what it can look like inside the mouth. Now, sometimes patients who have acute lupus can have other forms of skin lupus on other, either the same or other areas of their body. So you can have more than one subtype at a time. Um, and that can make it a little bit of a mixed picture, but um, it is something that we see at times. Another thing I wanted to mention, um, it's important to be aware of, is that there are some forms of drug-induced lupus. Um, when you're dealing with drug-induced systemic lupus, in those patients, skin involvement is actually very rare. Um, usually those patients just have photosensitivity and might have some easy bleeding into the skin. We call that purpura, but there's multiple uh, medications that can cause a drug-induced form of lupus. There's also a, um, a specific type of drug-induced lupus called that are caused by TNF alpha inhibitors. These are medicines that we are that we use for things like psoriasis um, and inflammatory bowel disease, and they can also cause a, um, a, a systemic lupus picture. When they get skin involvement, it can present like all the different types that we're talking about today. Now, this next picture here is a patient who might get, it's, it's a child, and um, one might imagine how the patient might get misdiagnosed with a more common skin condition, um, which we call tinea, or also known as ringworm, but this is actually not a, a fungal, and that's a fungal infection, and this is not a fungal infection. This is actually a form of skin lupus. So this is now, these are pictures of the next form called subacute cutaneous lupus. These are some pictures here. And then now we'll talk more details. So subacute cutaneous lupus, this is also non-scarring. Um, so it doesn't leave behind a permanent um, scar like we'll talk about with another type later. 
And about half of patients get these annular ring-like lesions, which we saw in the pictures, um, the prior slides. And about half of patients get more of a eczema or psoriasis type picture. But the difference is, is that patients who have eczema and psoriasis, they actually get, their rashes get better with the sun. The sun is in a way like a treatment. Whereas patients who have lupus and they have subacute cutaneous lupus, their rash gets much worse in the sun. And so this rash is actually most severe in areas that are chronically exposed to the sun. So they this rash is most common on the upper back, the shoulders, um, the outer arms, the V of the neck. But unlike the acute lupus where you get the malar rash, the SCLE, the subacute form, it actually tends to spare the face. Um, even though the face of course does get chronic sun, this form does tend to spare the face. So here's one of those pictures again, more up close, showing you the annular form, annular meaning that there's more this ring-like picture and you get this central lightening of the skin. We call that hypopigmentation and um, scale that's associated with these plaques. Here's a couple more pictures, outer arms, so photo distributive area. Some more pictures here, other pictures here. This nicely shows you where this form of lupus tends to be distributed. Again, this is sort of an opposite pattern of eczema or psoriasis, which gets better in the sun. So even though this one does not cause scarring, it like the first kind of lupus can also cause pigment change. And so you can see this patient has some what we call post-inflammatory pigment alteration as an after effect from their skin lupus. This is a picture of the more psoriasiform or eczema type of lesions. But again, this is happening in a, happening in a chronically sun exposed area. Okay, these patients, um, they <coughs> commonly, I'll, I'll men or mention another antibody test. So they commonly have a positive blood test for what's called an anti-Rho antibody, also called an SSA antibody. And this is one of the antibodies that actually are seen in another autoimmune condition called Sjogren's. And so you can have overlap between lupus and Sjogren's in many patients. And Sjogren's, the kind of classic symptoms are dry eyes and dry mouth. So sometimes we see that in our patients who have this those symptoms in our patients with subacute uh, lupus. And again, patients who have this form of lupus can have the other forms of lupus either at the same time or later on during their lifetime. So this is an example of a patient who has kind of overlapping features. This um, patient, he has the malar rash. It also involves his forehead. As I mentioned, that can happen. But on his shoulders and a little bit on his upper chest and neck, he also has these more subacute lesions. So again, we abbreviate that SCLE, which are these more scaly um, discrete papules on the upper trunk. Now, uh, it's... We mentioned drug-induced systemic lupus earlier, but it's really important to also be aware of drug-induced subacute cutaneous lupus because when someone is diagnosed with this second type of skin lupus, the subacute form, the first thing we go doing, the first thing we go looking for is looking for potential culprit on their medication list. So drug-induced SCLE is very common, and they, if they do get it from the medication, these patients are highly likely to develop a, this associated skin rash. And so um, there's different categories of medications that are more common. So this list includes common medicines like proton pump inhibitors, which are used for um, like GERD or amino acid reflux. Um, we can also get this type of rash from antifungal medicines, multiple different blood pressure medications, and even some other over-the-counter ones like ibuprofen products like NSAIDs or even antihistamines. So again, if someone, or like if you or someone you know is diagnosed with this type of lupus, it's always important to check their medication list. Because if you stop their medication, then um, they have the potential to have their lupus improve. Okay, this is now moving on um, as a, 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 photo, a clinical picture of now our next type of skin lupus. So the little purple dot is where we ended up doing a small little punch biopsy. We took a tiny sample of skin to make the right diagnosis. This patient was initially diagnosed with having rosacea. Again, you'll hear about rosacea a lot 
um, as a um, sort of a uh, part of the differential for lupus, but um, how and how lupus can sometimes get mistaken for rosacea. But this patient didn't have rosacea because they had this very adherent thick scale on the nose, which would not be what you would expect in rosacea, but was more concerning for a type of lupus called discoid lupus. So that now brings us to this third category. So discoid lupus is the most common type of the third category, which is called chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus. So we abbreviate it CCLE. And then of these chronic forms of skin lupus, the most common again is discoid lupus. This is by far the most common um, that we see of all the different types of skin lupus. But there's a couple other subtypes of chronic skin lupus. Um, one of them is a, is something called lupus paniculitis, which means that the skin disease actually involves the subcutaneous tissue, meaning the fat. So it's a deeper process, but sometimes it can involve the mucosa. Sometimes you can get a form of skin lupus called tumid lupus. Um, that one does not have any scale, but overall has a good prognosis. And then there's something, we'll look at a picture later called chillblands lupus, which can affect the fingers and the toes. So again, DLE or discoid lupus erythematosus, it's the most common form of chronic skin lupus. It presents as these well demarcated red to sometimes purplish scaly macules or papules. Like the name suggests discoid, they tend to look coin shape. They can start small and then become, can coalesce get, and become larger. Um, what's also interesting is that the scale that you see can actually extend deeper into the skin. It can go down into the hair follicles. And so if you were to peel off the skin, you, you see something called a carpet tack sign. Um, so the, the scale is quite prominent. So initially when these lesions first start, they may just look like um, areas of erythema or hyperpigmentation, but then as they evolve, the erythema expands and you get this active inflammation and hyperpigmentation more at the periphery, at the outer edge. And then in the center, you get depression of the skin due to scarring. And then you also get dilated blood vessels called telangiectasias and pigment change which we call depigmentation. There's a loss of pigment. And again, we'll look at pictures in a moment. When DLE, when discoid lupus is localized to the head and neck, um, then they are less likely to have internal disease versus if they have generalized discoid lupus, meaning the skin disease um, also involves skin below the neck. Those patients are more likely to have internal disease. But the most common places of discoid lupus overall is the face, the scalp, the ears, and the upper neck and outer arms. But the scalp is definitely very prominent. We, we often see scalp disease, and it, it happens in about 60% of patients. So this is a picture that shows kind of all those features of discoid lupus. So you see this erythema, the redness to the skin. There's another plaque up here. Um, you see this areas of depression where the skin is kind of um, sunken in. You see the scale that's kind of extending down into these hair follicles and it's kind of prominent over those hair follicles. Um, and you see a little bit of just that hyperpigmentation on the edge, that discoloration. Here's a patient who had just one plaque of discoid lupus in her scalp, later went on to develop more, but started in her scalp. And so this is this causes a form of scarring hair loss. We'll talk more about hair loss in a moment, but this is one of the main causes of hair loss is discoid lupus. And it has the scale, the erythema, the, the dispigmentation um, as well. Another common place for discoid lupus is actually inside the ear. So we call this little basin area right here, the conchal bowl. And this is a common place to get um, skin lupus. And so this, um, this is another patient who had more generalized discoid lupus, meaning it involved below the neck. This can show how severe things can get if it doesn't go tr get treated. This is a patient who had lupus, discoid lupus lesions on the lips. So it can even happen um, on the lips. Sometimes it presents as these more discrete papules on the elbows. So it can have a, a milder, more subtle start. Here's some scarring on the lip that can happen as a result to prior lupus. And this is back to the patient earlier who had this pink scaly plaque on the nose and then also on her cheeks. So for patients who have, um, of, of, of the patients who have systemic lupus, about 
30% of them will have discoid lupus lesions on their skin at some point. And then of the patients who initially present with discoid lupus, with this type of skin lupus, about 20% will over time go on to develop internal lupus. And so when we see patients with this, at baseline, we're screening them for internal disease, but then we're still following them and checking them at least once a year for any signs of internal disease. These are some other variants that can be more severe. There's a form called hypertrophic discoid lupus, which can mimic other types of skin diseases like bad fungal, like deep fungal infections. Um, earlier, I mentioned there's something called lupus paniculitis. This is one that is important in that it can cause a lot of disfiguration to the skin since it's a deep process. When, even when it resolves, if it was going on a long time, it can damage that fatty tissue and cause these saucerization appearances to the skin. So you can kind of lose that subcutaneous fat. It often happens on the face or the outer arm shoulders and then the, the hip area as well. And these patients are more likely to have underlying internal lupus, so they have to be followed more closely. These are some pictures of what that form of lupus paniculitis can look like. And then this is a patient who had both lupus paniculitis that caused that depression, but also had overlying discoid lupus. We call that combination lupus profundus. Here's another picture of lupus paniculitis. You get these nodules under the, or on the skin um, due to the subcutaneous tissue that's involved, the fatty tissue. Here's some more pictures of that combination of the two. More pictures, patient with lupus paniculitis and also some overlying discoid lupus. As I mentioned, you can also have discoid lupus in the mucosa, so the mouth, um, it is another location for this. And it can resemble other chronic skin diseases that, are, that more commonly involve the mouth, like something called lichen planus, which we won't go into. These are some, uh, this is a picture of a patient who had this sort of, we call it cribriform um, pattern to these erosions and ulcers on the, on the top of the mouth. Chilblain lupus. So this is a type of lupus that happens typically on the um, fingers and toes. Um, sometimes on the nose or other, um, we, we call them these acral sites. So sites that get uh, more um, exacerbated by cold. And um, over time, these patients, um, first it can look like kind of red to purple and just look like swollen, but then over time they can actually get discoid lesions that overlie that. So this is a patient with um, Chilblans lupus, and you can actually see there's discoid, discoid lesions overlying it. Some more pictures here. Okay, tumid lupus. This is another form of chronic skin lupus, but has overall good prognosis. There's no scale, no scarring, um, and it, it can affect the face or the trunk, but you get these hive-like papules, almost edematous looking, um, like they look more swollen. So uh, when it, edema just means kind of swelling in the skin. And so these are some pictures of tumid lupus. Some more pictures here.